Well, welcome everybody to the ULT San Diego Aquarian Series. And this week we will be taking up the topic of Hit the Mark, <laughs> the life and work of William Kwan Judge. And I will just uh, announce a few upcoming events and we'll get into our occasion for the day. So here's this gorgeous flyer that we've gotten lots of compliments on. I love that shot of him. And uh, that's me there shooting arrow. No, actually, it's uh, <laughs> William Kwan Judge shooting, doing archery and demonstrating concentration as he would. And um, the title is Hit the Mark, The Life and Work of William Kwan Judge, 1851 to 1896. And let's see here. Oh, so given that this is the Aquarian Almanac series and upcoming um, on March 25th, which is next week, we'll take up the topic of cyclic evolution. Look at this amazing uh, graphic uh, symbolizing cyclic evolution. And uh, the week after that, we will be taking up the topic of the monadic stream. And uh, the week after that, we'll be taking up the cycle of the Phoenix. Pretty awesome imagery here. And the week after that, the topic of mental posture. How do you approach theosophical learning? How do you approach any kind of spiritual learning? And let me scroll down a little bit more here. This uh, lets people know about the uh, Sunday morning meeting that we have at San Diego and we're doing uh, the Theosophical Tenets and we're taking up Bhavani Shankar and he has an essay called Nine Stages of Devotion. And uh, in the Secret Doctrine series we're taking up Time, Noumenal, and Phenomenal. How do you say Phenomenal? Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Laura, it's yeah. all yours. Let's thank you. Let's hear from you. Yep. Thank you. And before we start the talk, I'd like to express gratitude to all the wonderful spiritual ar archers who are here this evening <laughs> to join in this effort. As we know, the work of any great teacher is carried on by students into the future. Without the work and the study of each one, the work of Mr. Judge would not be visible. Um, through the efforts of all the students around the world in remembering Mr. Judge, we see that his work continues to be exemplified and valued. And those who are just getting to know Mr. Judge for the first time, we can ask why is there such an outpouring of devotion for Mr. Judge. And we'll be going into that a little bit tonight and we hope that you will see why there's that devotion. But the key thing is that the more we study the work and the writing of Mr. Judge, the more we learn about ourselves. It brings forth our own knowledge. It's not the knowledge of another. It's not just a learning in the regular sense, but it is a process of becoming that is exemplified in the writing of Mr. Judge. So we welcome you all and we mark his life and work today because it is the day, March 23rd, that in 1896, that uh, Mr. Judge left his body at the age of 45. And when he left his body, he left a body of work, of writings that we are grateful for. And we can understand these writings and exemplify 
theosophy by our own efforts. In humanity's triple evolution of mind, heart, and form, there are always those ahead of us and those behind us, beings who are less aware than ourselves and those who are more aware. Mr. Judge is a link in that chain of universal brotherhood and sisterhood. He was one who was ahead of us in mind and heart and work. Um, and we cannot see the mind and heart of another, but we can see the form, we can see the work of Mr. Judge. It is one thing to learn and gain occult knowledge, but it is another to give that knowledge a visible expression that can be of service to others. Mr. Judge was just such a being, an elder brother who through his work pointed out the way. In practical occultism, it is important to bring the knowledge of the unseen into a form that is of benefit and service. His life was an example that we can manifest to a degree in our own lives. A study class a decade ago that we held in the past was in a building devoted to helping others through various forms of exercise, yoga, healing and community. We held a monthly study class there and we read and discussed the ocean of theosophy by Mr. Judge. A young woman came into the meeting and upon reading the first few pages, looked up in a contemplative way and said, this is the first time I feel a sense of direction, that I have some place to go. That summed up beautifully the life and work of Mr. Judge. He gave to students a sense of direction, a possibility of our own. Muted. Looks like I got muted there. Okay. Mr. Judge revealed to us the importance of devotion, especially in his rendering of the Bhagavad Gita. He revealed to us that devotion is required to study occultism, a universal idea that gives us that sense of direction. What does this devotion look like in regards to our study of the unseen side of nature and of man? Without a focus or a nucleus, we have a difficult time navigating this ocean of knowledge called theosophy and can find ourselves too easily going off course. So what is it? that is that focus, that center we should devote ourselves to. In the words of HPB, it is the only thing that students of theosophy or occultism are asked to believe in. That is universal brotherhood. Not as an ideal, but as a fact. Not only in the human world, but in all the kingdoms of nature, visible and invisible. This devotion to the unity of life is a feeling that is unseen except through effect. It is what we see exemplified in the spiritual pilgrim we call Mr. Judge. He lived and worked from the age of 23 Amazing to think about from the age of 23, undaunted by the conditions around him. He lifted the hearts and minds of all he came in contact with 
with his effort and his efforts today still resonate with us through his writings. His ocean of theosophy and the answers to questions finished by his um, student, uh, Robert Crosby. His rendition of Patanjali's yoga aphorisms and the Bhagavad Gita with his notes and glossary of terms. His volumes of articles, the echoes of the Orient, the epitome of theosophy, and then finally the letters that have helped me published after his death. Letters he wrote to students of his time in of his, the students of his time in ways that still resonate today with us. All these books are read, studied, and discussed around the world in many languages. Other qualities students saw in Mr. Judge and we see in his work were calmness, patience, a strong understanding of duty, courage, selfless energy, and a dauntless will. One of the first principles of the study of theosophy appears in the beginning of the voice of the silence in the Bhagavad Gita. It is a discernment between the real and the unreal. And Mr. Judge exemplified that discernment. He saw in all beings a great potential and he stayed focused on that potential and never bothered with the changing, change, the changing personalities around him. He knew that forms and conditions change, but he also knew that the self shines in all. And that is where he worked. That was his focus. He saw the real being, the self in all that lives. And he came to the region of Sat, the true, and worked through all the conditions and environments of our humanity. He lit the way for us. He was a bright light on our path of becoming. Not too far ahead of us that we could not grasp hold of that work, but just far enough to keep us moving in the evolution of heart and mind, of booty and manis, in the application of the laws of the universe. Like a forerunner, he created forms and left them for others to work through. The following is an excerpt that he read at the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in 1893, at the age of 43, that exemplifies what we've been talking about so far. And it's good to keep in mind that 130 years later, this summer, students of theosophy, theosophy will be attending the 2023 Parliament of World Religions in Chicago. And Mr. Judge said in his address at that time, it would be a good thing to read at the address uh, for the Parliament this year as well. There is in this world an actual universal brotherhood of men and women, of souls, a brotherhood of beings who practice universal brotherhood by always trying to influence souls of men for their good. We insist that universal brotherhood is a fact in nature. It is a fact for the lowest part of nature, for the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, and the mineral kingdom. We are all atoms obeying the laws together. Our denying it does not disprove it. It simply puts off the day of reward and keeps us miserable, poor, and selfish. Why just think of it? If all in Chicago today, in the United States, would act as Jesus said, as Buddha 
has said, as Confucius said, as all the great ethical teachers of the world have said, do unto others as you would have them unto you. Would there be any necessity for legal measures for policemen with clubs in this park as you had them the other day? No, I think there would be no necessity. And that is what one of this great brotherhood had said. And I think he's quoting H.P. Blavatsky here from the key to theosophy. All the troubles in the world would disappear in a moment if men and women would only do one quarter of what they could and what they ought. It is not God who is damn, is to damn you to death or to misery. It is yourself. The Theosophical dis Society desires above all things, he further says, not that you should understand spiritualism, not that wonderful occult works should be performed, but to understand the constitution of matter and of life as they are, which we can never understand except by practicing right ethics. Live with each other as brothers, for the misery and trouble of the world are of more importance than any scientific progress that may be imagined. Christians, atheists, Jews, pagans, heathen, or theosophists try to practice universal brotherhood, which is the duty of all men and women. Mr. Judge understood that theosophy was not the work of one man, nor the work of a few, but the work of a body of brothers and sisters, of students and inquirers, he was a co-founder in the effort of 1875 to bring forward again the wisdom religion and to give it a name, Theosophy. Through his work, Theosophy is the most visible it has been in 2000 years. As a co-founder with H.P. Blavatsky, they brought forward this ancient wisdom religion to a form that is visible for all of us to see. And as HPB herself said, this effort was for those who called it forth. It was time for humanity to receive once more this truth. And we have a responsibility to that effort. The boy we came to know as Mr. Judge was born on April 13th in 1851 in Dublin, Ireland. At the age of seven, this young boy suffered a severe illness and was declared dead by the physicians when he remarkably revived. The family noticed a change in character after his recovery. He had a greater desire for study and for learning and a strong interest in art and literature. And from his eighth birthday, he could read all he wanted to on religions, magic, mesmerism, Rosicrucianism, and none around him ever saw him learning to read. Trying to understand its meaning, he became deeply absorbed in the book of Revelations. It may have revealed itself to him as an allegory, an allegory for the spiritual path, for the battle between good and evil within each one of us. He later reflected this understanding in his writing of the Bhagavad Gita in English for students of the West, showing he understood deeply the metaphysics contained in both Revelations and the Bhagavad Gita. For further understanding of this time in his life, there's an article he wrote later titled The Borrowed Body. 
This could give insights into his experience as that young boy and why his body gave him such trouble. In this story, he speaks of living and studying with his guru in India when he was visited by a master who reminded him of a pledge he had made long ago and asked if he would fulfill that pledge. The Raja, which is a name that many called Mr. Judge later on in his life, the Raja said yes. During sleep, the master took him to the bedside of a young boy who was near death. The dying boy gave permission to the master to use the form that he was leaving behind. Through the incantation of the master, Raja entered the boy's body and the boy revived. So now Raja had two astrals to manage, one by day and one by night. We wonder if his other stories contain memories of lives previously lived and lessons learned and abilities achieved. From that day forward, Mr. Judge, as a young man, a young boy, showed a lot of determination and never let a few obstacles deter him. An acquaintance shared a story how, as a young boy, he wanted to join his friends as they swam across the river but he didn't know how to swim. So taking deep breaths, he sank to the bottom and walked across the riverbed. He would come up for air and then plunge down again until he crossed. In reading this again, I was reminded in a further study in the glossary written by H.P. Blavatsky, the definition of a pratikya Buddha which is definitely not what Mr. Judge was. He was completely selfless and wanted to serve humanity. But it reminded me that in the glossary, a Pratikya Buddha is described as a horse which crosses a river swimming without touching the ground. Mr. Je Mr. Judge definitely had his feet on the ground, living a life limited by the race mind. He never wavered in his study and work in application of truth and his service to humanity. He picked up the threads that had begun lifetimes ago. He first met HBB in 1874 at 46 Irving Place, New York City, at the age of 23, just before the founding of the Theosophical Society in 1875. Mr. Judge wrote of that meeting and he said, I first met HBB in this life by her request sent through Colonel H. L. Alcott. The call was made in her rooms when then as afterwards through the remainder of her stormy career, she was surrounded by the anxious, the intellectual, the bohemian, and the rich and the poor. It was her eye, said Mr. Judge, that attracted me, the eye of one whom I must have known in lives long passed away. She looked at me in recognition at this first hour and never since has that look changed. Not as a questioner of philosophies did I come before her. Not as one groping in the dark for lights that schools and fanciful theories had obscured. But as one who, wandering many periods through the corridors of life, was seeking the friends who could show where the designs for the work had been hidden. And true to the call, she responded, revealing the plans once again and speaking no words to explain, simply pointed them out and went on with the task. It was as if 
but the evening before we had parted, leaving yet to be done some detail of task. It was elder brother and younger, both bent on one single end, but she with the power and the knowledge that belonged but to lions and sages. So, friends, from the first, I felt safe. It is interesting here that Mr. Judge refers to H.B. Blavatsky as a brother. We could see that in the realm of soul, there is no gender. That on the higher planes, we are men, brothers together, even while in the physical realm of the dual nature. It is also good to take note of another position Mr. Judge had and showed to us. It was one that was beyond the plane of like and dislike, of opinion and ego, a plane from which we can recognize our true work and workers from ages past, that we too can pick up the threads of previous lives with renewed sense of duty. Many students have this recognition of people and the work around them. It is not our first time working with theosophy. We get great help from Mr. Judge's writings in showing us that our understanding of theosophy is not about getting away from the mundane life, but it is of infusing theosophy into the mundane or the daily life to live the higher life while in a body of a temporary nature. After helping HBB and Colonel Alcott form the Theosophical Society in 1875, and after spending long hours in talks and discussions with HPB for just over a year, HPB and Colonel Alcott left New York, and Mr. Judge was on his own until, the eight, until 1884, nine years later. All the excitement, curiosity, and interest stirred by HPB died down after she left. And Mr. Judge, who was now the recording secretary of the Theosophical Society at the age of 24, continued to hold meetings. Without a body of fellow workers, Mr. Judge carried on all the public meetings in an empty hall. Reading a chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, delivering a talk, and taking the minutes, creating that form that many today still use, even though he was the only one present. One evening, an inquirer entered the hall, a Mr. A. Nurheimer, who became one of Judge's earliest friends. Mr. Nurheimer saw an advertisement of a talk and went to the hall, he sat at the back of the empty room while Mr. Judge spoke, and he was moved by the energy and value of the talk. He became a member of the TS and an active supporter of Mr. Judge's work. In 1895, when there was a split in the American section, Mr. Nurheimer remained loyal to Mr. Judge and this caused him to lose his membership at the Adyar Society in 1985. In April of 1884, when ISIS was near completion, Mr. Judge and his brother John Judge helped HPB in the printing of ISIS Unveiled while she was in France. At the age of 33, Mr. Judge completed an index for ISIS that would also go on to help with the editing of the Secret Doctrine, which HVB had already started. During this same year, he was appointed the permanent secretary for the American section. In June of 1884, after nine years on his own in America, he was summoned to India to help with an attack on HPB by the columns in Adyar. 
an attack that was supported by the missionaries from the Christian college at Madras. When I read all this history, and I'm a terrible historian, sorry, what stood out is the futility of waiting for good and favorable conditions. Mr. Judge, HPB and Colonel Alcott kept focus on the work of theosophy for humanity and weathered all kinds of storms in this effort, setting an example that we can all follow today in our work. In one of his articles, Mr. Judge ends with um, a phrase which I always hold forward in, in, in the work that I do. It's called, and it just says, work, work, work. Focus on the work. Move forward in the work, you know, that we don't get caught up in the storms. Don't look sideways. Just keep your mind, eye on the work to be done. In July of 1884, Judge arrived at what was Bombay. And again, he shows us what this work, work, work looks like. Instead of focusing on the storm, the three days after he arrived, he gave a talk on theosophy and the destiny of India. He knew where to put his mind and his thoughts and his focus. He gave five other talks after that long journey across the ocean in TS branches in different cities around India before he arrived at Adyar on August 10th. He repaired what damage had been done by the columns and set up HVB's rooms in order for her return to India. Not much is written on the last month of Mr. Judge's time in India. No records at Adiar show where he was, and he was silent on this and did not give any details and only later gave some hints. It is recorded that he met Master Moria at Adyar during that time. Again, we can only look at the effects that we see. And um, in, in 1886, um, HBB wrote of Mr. Judge after that time in India that, and this is in quotes, he had not realized the change that had taken place in him a few years before when a Nirmanakaya had blended with his astral nature. Upon, and we can see that in his, the effect of that effort and that time in India, when he returned to New York, Mr. Judge writes an increasing number of articles just counting his selected art articles previous to his trip to India, he wrote uh, during, um, from 1875 to 1883, there were only four articles written. After his time in India, the articles averaged 20 to 30 a year, often more. The Universal Theosophy website uh, gives a list of the articles and the year that they were written. For anyone who would like to research that, it's quite interesting. We cannot go wrong with the contemplation of the writings of Mr. Judge. Reading between the lines, we discover the wisdom, the teaching of the masters, and the property of all of humanity. His writings awaken our own independent self-effort. And it is this that sets his writing apart from all the other theosophical writers of that time. He started the Path magazine in 1886. His life seemed transformed. His character and powers of expression gained new meaning and depth. HPB wrote in an address of her gratitude um, to Mr. Judge. Uh, this address was read by Annie Besant at the Fifth Convention 
of the American section of the Theosophical Society on April 15th in 1891. Had it not been for William Q. Judge, Theosophy would not be where it is today in the United States. It is he who has mainly built up the movement among you, and he who has proved in a thousand ways his entire loyalty to the best interests of theosophy and the society. Mutual admiration should play no part in theosophical convention, but honor should be given where honor is due. And I shall gladly take this opportunity of stating in public by the mouth of my friend and colleague, Annie Besant, my deep appreciation of the work of your general secretary and of publicly tendering him my most sincere thanks and deeply felt gratitude in the name of theosophy and for the noble work he is doing and has done. All this said after 16 years of Mr. Judge's work, so much that he accomplished in a very short period of time. This letter and the reading of it by Annie Besant was very significant um, due to the approaching death of H.P. Blavatsky. He was well loved by those who knew him and worked closely with him. He was made vice president of the TS in 1888 and by a unanimous vote made president of the American and European sections in 1892, a year after the death of H.P. Blavatsky. We all know the amount of work that these um, tasks uh, carry and uh, he did that work while he was writing articles, giving talks, having meetings. Quite amazing. An architect, an American architect, Claude Bragdon, a writer and a theosophist, sums up the life and work of Mr. Judge with these words. No figure rises out of the dim limbo of that recent though already now distant past, with a more engaging presence than that of this handsome Irish American. And I venture to say that in a movement which has been a forcing house for greatness, no one developed such power, such capacity, such insight in so short a space of time when the pressure was put upon him as judge. There is abundant evidence aside from the best evidence of all, the fruitfulness of his labors, that he was under the direct guidance of the masters. One adept wrote of him, when the presence is upon him, he knows well that which others only suspect and divine. In the same letter, he is referred to as the one who of all chelas suffers the most and demands or expects the least. He was a man of exquisite sympathy, gentleness, and sternness with himself, but lenient towards others. Mr. Kitely has said, Judge made the life portrayed by Jesus realizable by me to me. He was that rare and beautiful thing, a practical mystic. One of his last messages to his intimate band of followers was that they should learn by actual experience that occult development comes best, quickest, and safest in the timely fulfillment of the smallest duties of life. As a person, Mr. Judge was an inspirational, warm figure. His wise and kind ways 
enabled others to help him build the Theosophical Society in America into a body of a hundred lodges and 6,000 members. In the 10 years to his too early passing on March 21st, 1896, just short of his 45th birthday. His last words were, there should be calmness, hold fast and go slow. So we're going to turn the meeting over to everyone now and we're going to look at some readings that students have sent in on the life and work of Mr. Judge. Okay, so I'm gonna share a screen. Okay. Does everyone see the screen? Is it showing, Jonathan? Um, it's not sharing yet. Oh, not sharing yet. Okay. All right. Looks like it's we'll working out. Try again here. How's that? Yep, it's working, working good. Good. How do you get rid of that? Okay, there we go. So we have, we hope that other people, well, I can't see everyone now because I'm sharing screen. So um, we hope everyone will, um, if you brought a reading, maybe there'll be time at the end that you could share it, but we'll take a look at the ones that were sent in first. We see here a, a tower, and we can, of course, many students are familiar with Mr. Judge's uh, um, tale of the tower. And in that tale, one of the things that he shares with us, the importance of keeping an eye on our own fire, our own mind, the burning of our own fuel, rather than peering about as the uh, at what's going on with all the other fires. So, the first reading uh, submitted was from Astrological Influences, and it was submitted by Kelly. And is Kelly available to read it? She I think she said she was not going to be able to make it. Okay. Do we have a volunteer to read um, this passage? Ken, what do you think? Okay. Uh, Ken, do you want to come up here where the microphone is? Yeah. I don't know how you move that out of the way. Oh, there we go. Hello there. This is uh, Ken here in San Diego from the Astrological mm -hmm. Influences. Over the ambitious signature of Magus, a correspondent asks in your July issue, quote, what is the planetary influence and how does it act on man? Unquote. Nemo, in his reply, answers other questions but fails to answer this one. Not being myself a magus, I will not assume to fully describe planetary influence. So to do so would lead us into realms quite beyond our comprehension. But we will get a better idea of the subject by recollecting that the ancients always considered the ambient or the entire heaven at birth as being that which affected man and that planets were only the pointers or indices showing when and where the influence of the ambient would be felt. The modern astrologers following those great leaders but unable to grasp the enormous subject reduced the scheme to the influences of planets. They have thus come to leave out, to a great extent, the influences cast by powerful stars, which often produce effects not to be sought for under planets. Quote, when such stars have rule, no wise nor fool can stay their influence, unquote. The planets were held, rightly, as I think, to be only foci for the influence of the whole ambient, unquote 
having, ha however, a power of their own of a secondary nature, exercisable when the ambient influence was weak. When London was burnt by a mighty star, not a planet, had rule, and Napoleon was prefigured by a star also, his fall being due in fact to the aspect of the heavens as a whole and not to the ruling of Wellington's significator. A slight accident might have thrown the power of the latter out of the horary field. Similarly, the cyclic vicissitudes of this globe will not be shown by any planetary scheme, but by certain stars that fix the destiny of poor Earth. When they have their day and term, the wise man will be unable to rule his own stars or any others. Thank you. Okay, Kelly. What do we understand of this? I'd like to ask Kelly. What is this telling us? Anyone have an idea? Why would this be important to Kelly? What's being said? This seems to provide uh, some kind of insight about the idea that these the the planetary influences are real, but it's not at the physical level somehow, mm -hmm. and that the whole thing is a demonstration of the unity of the cosmos, the the living body, I guess you could say, of the cosmos, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. It's it's like a this is a universe of law. And the laws, the law, and every part of the universe. Okay, let's forward to the next slide. Okay. This slide is a picture of uh, Mr. Judge, and I believe it's at the Parliament of World Religions. We see him on the right side of your screen, and looking from the left in a younger form than we usually see is Robert Crosby, who is sitting on the left side looking at him. And um, I'm not sure who the other three gentlemen are. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes the three in the middle. Does anyone know who they might be? Or those two lovely boys at the front? How lucky are they to be there? It looks like one of them might be Kitely. Yeah, I thought Kitely. I wondered if the other one might be... Um, uh oh what was his name? Archibald. Uh, Archibald? And, yeah. And the other one was called, uh, well, there's two of them. And Bertrand. Yes. What was that? Bertrand, he said. Bertrand. Yeah. 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 And one's, an, one's the uncle and the other one's the nephew. And I forgot which ones are which. And they're only two years apart, I believe. Mm -hmm. All remarkable students as well. Yeah, and have very significant parts to play. Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, this uh, reading was submitted by Pierre. Is he with us tonight? I don't think he was able to come. Would someone like to volunteer to read this? You know, um, Joe, I hate to put you on the spot, but you're a really good reader. Yes, he is. Very good. Maybe uh, uh, from the from the Theosophical Movement, uh, mm -hmm. page one twenty four. The Theosophical Movement being continuous, it is to be found in all times and in all nations. Wherever thought has struggled to be free, wherever spiritual ideas, as opposed to forms and dogmatism, have been promulgated, there the great movement is to be discerned. Jakob Bema's work was a part of it. So also was the Theosophical Society of over 100 years ago. Luther's Reformation must be reckoned as a portion of it. And the great struggle between science and religion, clearly portrayed by Draper, was every bit as much a motion of the Theosophical movement as is the present society of that name. Indeed, that struggle and the freedom thereby gained for science were really as important in the advance of the world as are our different organizations. 
And among political examples of the movement is to be counted the independence of the American colonies, ending in the formation of a great nation theoretically based on brotherhood. One can therefore see that to worship an organization, even though it be the beloved theosophical one, is to fall down before form and to become the slave once more of that dogmatism which our portion of the theosophical movement, the TS, was meant to overcome, overthrow. That's a very important message for us to keep in mind. We should never think that theosophy is any organization or form. The form or the organization is important because it gives us a vehicle to work through. And so we are searching for truth and we are trying to find truth through theosophy. But we should never ever think that this truth cannot be found anywhere else. It is found everywhere. In fact, the more we understand theosophy, the more we study the keys that HBB has given us, the more we begin to see it all around us. All around us. The next reading is from letters that have helped me. And I'll read this one. Well, Monica's here. Oh, Monica's. Oh, yes. This one's from you. My my screen is covered up by the uh, bar at the top, so I couldn't there's, remember. Yes, this is Monica's. Thank you. Monica. But there's, there's two from Monica. Should we? Yes. Should, should Monica read them both, or should she choose which one she wants Oh, no. Read? She's going to read them both. Oh, okay. Voice right. is beautiful. Okay. Uh, this is Letters That Have Helped Me, pages 72, 73. So the masters have said, this is a transition age. And he who has ears to hear will hear what has thus been said. We are working for the new cycles and centuries. What we do now in this transition age will be like what the great Dian Chohans did in the transition point, the midway point in evolution. At the time when all matter and all types were in a transition and fluid state, they then gave the new impulse for the new types, which resulted later in all the vast varieties of nature. In mental development, we are now at the same point. And what we do now in faith and hope for others and for ourselves will result similarly on the plane to which it is all directed. Thus, in other centuries, we will come out again and go on with it. If we neglect it now, so much the worse for us then. Hence, we are not working for some definite organization of the new years to come, but for a change in the manas and booty of the race. That is why it may seem indefinite, but it is nevertheless very defined and very great in scope. Let me refer you to that part of the secret doctrine penned by Master himself where the midway point of evolution is explained in reference to the ungulate mammals. It should give you a glimpse of what we have to do and remove all vain longings for a present sojourn with our unseen guides and brothers. Concretely, there is a certain object for our general work. It is to start up a new force a new current in the world, whereby great and long time yanis or wise ones will be attracted back to incarnate among men here and there and thus bring back the true life and the true practices. 
Let us then have great faith and confidence. See how many have gone out from your center to many and distant parts of the world, and how many will continue to go for the good and the gain of man of all places. We have to educate the West so that it may appreciate the possibilities of the East and thus on the waiting structure in the East may be built up a new order of things for the benefit of the whole. We have each one of us to make ourselves a center of light, a picture gallery from which shall be projected on the astral light such scenes, such influences, such thoughts as may influence many for good, shall thus arouse a new current and then finally result in drawing back the great and the good from other spheres from beyond the earth. Let us then have great faith and confidence. See how many have gone out from time to time from your center to many distant parts of the world and how many will continue to go for the good and the gain of man of all places. I give you my best wishes and brotherly greeting for the new year and for every year that is to come. Affectionately yours, William Kwan Judge. Thank you. Would you would like to say any words about that reading, Monica? Well, I think that being a student who uh, came in very early, very young, sound asleep, and then had a time in uh, the karma where I could not be in classes or study in the way I wanted to, bits and pieces of the teachings uh, that I had certainly remained with me. But this focus that Judge speaks about, this uh, dharma of uh, the effort to make a change, as he says, in the manas and booty of the race, somehow put everything in a far better perspective for me. I don't know that I'm that far out of personality and social gatherings that when I come to the lodge or uh, come to Zoom meetings, I'm free of that whole uh, way of operating or thinking. Uh, so this uh, help to break up some of that and to get clear. Yes, we all love one another. Yes, we are one in our effort. There is a very uh, specific and high purpose at work here uh, that has to do with the cycles. Um, and uh, him putting the other cycles, speaking about the other cycles in time, where this had to happen, uh, it just made it even more clear. So it was, it was very clarifying and dear to my heart, and made me, uh, I think, understand uh, Mr. Judge's will, his strong will, uh, even uh, I, I think a bit more clearly. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Monica. You know, it it brings back to mind as 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 it says. You know, when he um, his uh, sentiments that he had when he um, first met HPB, when he said, you know, it was her eye that attracted me. Mm -hmm. And we may get caught up in our life um, paths, our side paths, our careers, our families, whatever it is we're doing. But when we, when I read that part, when Mr. Judge met HPB, it kind of gave heart to the fact that yes, we too can pick up the threads of our past incarnation, that we can pick up the threads of our past work for theosophy. If we can get past the um, the living for like and dislike and for passions and desires, that we too will recognize each other 
when we'll recognize the threads of our past as they manifest in our lives ahead. So would you like to read your next uh, quote from the letters that have helped me? It is um, from page 105. Oh, well, thank you uh, very much for those words. First of all, that it's just magnificent. But yes, let me read from page 105. See what I said in the opening volume of The Path, the study of what is now called practical occultism was not the subject of that journal. We regard it as incidental to the journey along the path. The traveler in going from one city to another has perhaps to cross several rivers. Maybe his conveyance fails him and he is obliged to swim or he must in order to pass a great mountain no engineering in order to tunnel through it or is compelled to exercise the art of locating his exact position by observation of the sun. But all that is only incidental to his main object of reaching his destination. We admit the existence of hidden powerful forces in nature and believe that every day greater progress is made towards an understanding of them. Astral body formation, clairvoyance, looking into the astral light and controlling elements is all possible, but not all profitable. The electrical current, which when resisted in the carbon, produces intense light, may be brought into existence by any ignoramus who has the key to the engine room and can turn the crank that starts the dynamo, but is unable to prevent his fellow man or himself from being instantly killed should that current accidentally be diverted through his body. The control of these hidden forces is not easily obtained, nor can phenomena be produced without danger. And in our view, the attainment of true wisdom is not by means of phenomena, but through the development which begins within. The very first step in true mysticism and true occultism is to try to apprehend the meaning of universal brotherhood, without which the very highest progress in their practice of magic turns to ashes in the mouth. We appeal, therefore, to all who wish to raise themselves and their fellow creatures, man and beast, out of the thoughtless dog trot of selfish everyday life. It is not thought that utopia can be established in a day but through the spreading of the idea of universal brotherhood, the truth in all things may be discovered. What is wanted is true knowledge of the spiritual condition of man, his aim and destiny. Such a study leads us to accept the utterance of Prajapati to his sons. Be restrained, be liberal, be merciful. It is the death of selfishness. This is the line for us to take and to persevere in, that all may in time obtain the true light. Thank you, Monica. That is a beautiful quote. I, I love, I really love it. I yes. think uh, this immediately, uh, in so many ways uh, that I can think of, separates us uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the phenomena and helps us to focus on the truths of which, of which in our highest self, if I understand correctly, is what we are. So I feel very grateful for um, yes. him offering us this discipline. Yes. Well, here's what we are right there. It's all there within us. 
the male, the female, the archetypes, the forms, you know, the pearls, which represent the lifetimes. <laughs> so the next reading is from the Bhagavad Gita, and it was submitted by Robert. Um, is Robert available to read? Yes, uh, Robert is available. Wonderful. Thank you, Robert. To me. Um, this is uh, on the theme of hit the mark. And also um, the quote from Gandhi on Monday from the Almanac says, the secret of life is selfless service. The highest ideal for us is to become mitaragra, free from attachment. So <clears throat> that's kind of the spirit of this quote. Uh, notes on the Bhagavad Gita from chapter six. We must discover what actions ought to be performed by us and do them for that reason and not because of some result we expect to follow. The fact that we may be perfectly certain of the result is no reason for allowing our interest to fasten upon them. Here again is where certain theosophists think they have a great difficulty. They see that knowing the result, one is sure to become interested in it. But this is the very task to be assayed, to so hold one's mind and desire as not to be attached to the result. By pursuing this practice, true meditation is begun and will soon become permanent. Or one who watches his thoughts and acts so as to perform those that ought to be done will acquire a concentration in time which will increase the power of real meditation. That I don't know if it strikes other people, but with the interest in meditation these days, uh, here we have the idea that Real meditation comes from right action and the renunciation of action. And that will lead to true concentration and true meditation. And uh, you think about Judge's article, Will and Desire. You know, if all our desires are focused upon the welfare of humanity, then everything will be magnetized in one direction, resulting in perfect concentration. So that's, uh, of course, this is no easy task because he goes on to say that this would take many lives to perfect this practice, but that's no reason not to begin now. Yes, we have to begin it. Um, thank you, Robert. You know, well, we can see that. I mean, if we've allowed our passions and our likes and dislikes to be stirred by the court through the course of our day, um, it will be very difficult for us to concentrate and to meditate at the end of the day. So it requires the right performance of action has to be achieved through the day. And it's a very important part of our meditation. Thank you. And then we have Jonathan's quote from the Synthesis of Occult Science. Okay. Um, it may be conceived that the ego in man is a monad that has gathered to itself innumerable experiences through eons of time, slowly unfolding its latent potencies through plane after plane of matter. It is hence called the eternal pilgrim. Um, I would say that this was very skillfully put right behind uh, Robert's reading um, because in Robert's reading, it was like the more you do action and service, actually that facilitates meditation and the unfolding of the power to meditate. This is like that too. He's the way he's talking about the monad here. Um, it, it has deep meaning for our lives. The, the the monad, the ego, the eternal pilgrim, all these are words for who we really, really are um, and what we're about and what we're here to do. 
um, it seems like, and I think that's one of the um, geniuses of Judge, is to put in very simple language, very, very deep um, insights and uh, instruction. And uh, so it looks like the ego is a monad that is, is going about gathering innumerable experiences through eons of time. And as was said by Laura at the outset, theosophy is actually an invitation to become engaged, to, in, to involve oneself um, from the perspective of the spiritual in the realm of the mundane. I think she said something like that. Yes. Um, and uh, so that is the way that we actually gather experiences. It isn't just uh, kind of bungling around, bumping into things, but it's, it's a deliberate um, um, life of service and creativity and action in the service of all. And then in that process, one gathers innumerable experiences through eons of time. But at the same time, it's unfolding latent potencies. So it's not just gathering from the outside going inward, it's the release of the inner genius and wisdom in the process. And in both of these from within without and from without within processes um, have a reciprocity and magnify one another. That's right. And those latent potencies, they're all gathering in there through our experience. It, and they will bloom. They will come forth. And um, we don't need to worry about that. We can trust karma to take care of that. We just need to uh, perform good action, gain the experience, and shine the light through the mundane. Thank you, Jonathan. I think, yeah, there we have Mr. Judge. See, we're all spiritual archers, like Mr. Judge. So the last reading is is one that I picked. It's, it's my absolute favorite. And um, comes from the Ocean of Theosophy, page three. And we'll close with this one. The most intelligent being in the universe, man, has never then been without a friend but has a line of elder brothers who continually watch over the progress of the less progressed, preserve the knowledge gained through aeons of trial and experience. There's Jonathan. It's quote, they have always existed as a body, all knowing each other, no matter in what part of the world they may be and all working for the race in many different ways. Thank you, Laura, so much. Um, I think that our time is up. Um, yes. And I just uh, can't express enough my gratitude for putting this together so brilliantly perfectly on time um and um i would just remind us that our next uh, presentation next week is on cyclic evolution and uh that very much fits in with our theme for today so thank you all very much for coming and thank you laura so much thank you everyone thank, thank you laura was thank you thank you it's wonderful. Take good yes, care. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Everyone, thank you, Laura. Good night. Good night.